very pleased and honored to invite our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Jan Lowe is the 2016 World, Prize, World Food Prize co-laureate and the principal scientist and co-leader of the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health Initiative, Sasha Project Manager of the International Potato Center. And today she'll be speaking to us about reaching the urban consumers and building markets for smallholder farmers with biofortified sweet potato processed products. Thank you. Well, I don't think I'm going to be as controversial as the last group, so I hope you guys are still all awake after your lunch. It's great to be here, and I've been enjoying being here at the Manus Center this week. Um, earlier in the week, I spoke to people about what our major work is, and that is the focus on combating vitamin A deficiency with the biofortified orange flesh sweet potato. And the reason we've taken this approach is uh, because the vi vitamin A deficiency prevalence in sub-Saharan Africa among the under five children is very high. Even now, the estimated prevalence rate is 48%. And it's a very rich source of pro-vitamin A or beta carotene. Just one small orange flesh sweet potato root provides the daily vitamin A needs of a young child. So we've worked a lot on developing integrated agriculture nutrition strategies, which works on the behavioral change front of improving dietary practice together with the introduction of the orange flesh sweet potato. And most of you who are from Sub-Saharan Africa know that for whatever reason, sweet potato came from the Americas. For whatever reason, the dominant varieties there are white fleshed or yellow fleshed. So really the orange and the orange types are a new introduction. And uh, to, to build on what the last group uh, was talking about, the first question I get in any country is, is it a G GMO because of the color? And it's not. Sweet potato has a lot of natural diversity in the germplasm, and all our orange flesh varieties are conventionally bred. One of the benefits of working with the orange flesh sweet potato is in most countries, it's predominantly a woman's crop. And women tend to be in charge of the household diet and care of young children. So it's an easy entry point for making a change. It's resilient and easy to grow crop uh, under many of our conditions. And so we've spent uh, the last 20 years really building that evidence base and taking it to scale. And under the Sweet Potato for Profit and Health uh, initiative that I co-lead, we are now have reached 4.5 million families in over 10 countries with improved varieties of sweet potato. So today I want to talk about diversified use and what we're doing to break into the urban markets. And I think, I think the, starting out, let's see the contrast. And really, the dominant sweet potato producer of all types of sweet potato is China. China right now in 2000, and these figures are from 2016, China produces 67% of the world's production of sweet potato. Africa is now at 20%, uh, followed by the other Asian countries the, and the Americas. So you can see we have a lot of concentration of uh, sweet potato production in China. And uh, Africa is increasing, but nowhere near the Chinese numbers. In total, there's 105 million tons produced uh, annually of sweet potato in the world. And you can see China knows about diversified use. Uh, in China, only 10% of the roots are eating fresh. Whereas if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, probably I would say 95% of the root production goes into steamed or boiled roots for human consumption. Um, so it's a complete contrast in how the roots are being utilized. And the rest in China goes into animal feed, Particularly, it's been an important pig feed over the years, and pigs and sweet potato love to move together. Um, they, uh, just let a pig into your sweet potato field, and you know what I mean. Um, you won't have much left there after a while. And China uh, has anything you can possibly make out of sweet potato, they do. There's a $2 billion noodle industry, sweet potato noodles, instant noodles in all the train stations. There's crisps, there's chips, there's biscuits, there's 
flour, and they call uh, sweet potato putty or puree, candies, you name it, they can make it. And one of the reasons they can make such a diverse range is they have relatively very cheap sweet potato compared to sub-Saharan Africa. And that's because their average yields, according to FAO data, which we always have to take with a little grain of salt, um, but their average yields are 22 tons per hectare, very good management uh, uh, of their sweet potato, compared on average in the FAO data to five tons per hectare. And none of these figures are near the potential for sweet potato. If you go to South Africa, for instance, and you have irrigated, fertilized sweet potato production with good agronomic practice, they're doing 60 to 70 tons per hectare. And I imagine in Israel, you probably as well are getting very high yields of 50 to 60 tons per hectare. Um, so we have a long way to go in, in terms of getting these averages up with improved varieties, improved agronomic practices, uh, but it's a very flexible crop that can grow from sea level to 2,400 meters. So why are we interested? We obviously, our main thrust at the International Potato Center is tackling uh, rural malnutrition and getting more OFSP into the diet, orange flesh sweet potato, into the diet as an inexpensive source of vitamin A. But we are living and working on the fastest urbanizing continent. Um, we have a 4.1% annual urbanization rate in Africa compared to the global rate of 2%. I see it every time. I, I live in Nairobi and it just boggles the mind the number of people moving to the cities every year. Um, urban consumers, as we know and as we've heard in the earlier sessions, they want foods that are convenient and affordable. And we are also tackling, you know, with a root and tuber crops, and the consumption of root and tubers tends to drop off as societies urbanize because they have a lot of water in them. They're bulkier to transport than the grains. So how do we get it into and being utilized in the urban food centers? And we, as part of our campaign, have been really working on the image of sweet potato because it is seen and known as the crop that is there when the maize fails. And with climate change, let me tell you, maize has been failing a lot. And now we have the fall armyworm. Um, so sweet potato um, is becoming much more important in these food systems, but it is associated with times when other crops fail and it's associated with the poor. So, Many well-off urban consumers see sweet potato as, oh, that's what I used uh, when I grew up in the rural areas. Now I'm better off. I'm eating bread. I'm eating rice. And the, uh, the problem with a lot of that in many African countries, most of the wheat flour is imported, and very few African countries produce sufficient amounts of rice. We do see in the urban areas roasted sweet potato being sold along the roadside, and fried sweet potato as two products, particularly fried sweet potato, is quite popular as a snack product in West Africa. So when we were deciding how do we break into this urban market and how should we break into this urban market with our orange flesh sweet potato, taking the perspective that a processed product utilizing orange flesh sweet potato as an ingredient um, could create markets for farmers. And we chose to undertake this initiative uh, in Rwanda. And why in Rwanda? It's a very densely populated country and sweet potato is their most important food. They eat over 80 kilograms per capita per year. It's a primary staple. Here I imagine you see sweet potato as a vegetable. In East and Central Africa, it's a staple food. Rwanda has, is the land of a thousand hills. And on each hill, you probably have a thousand families. I mean, the average per capita land holding size is now down to 0.2 hectares per capita. So you've got to have a crop that will give you some pretty high energy output per unit time, per unit area. And they have two major rainy seasons and can do year round production of the sweet potato. So the big complaint of farmers in Rwanda was we don't have market. Everybody grows it. There's no place to sell it. Big gluts with big price drops. The government was really focused on what they call modern crops, uh, crops that could be sold, that had good markets, 
And, uh, but it is seen as a critical food security crop in the country. So the challenge as we were setting up, how are we gonna intervene and come up with moving forward with processed product markets in Rwanda, were making sure from the outset that women who were in charge of growing sweet potato in Rwanda were not excluded as we developed the value chain. We've seen this in a number of sub-Saharan African countries when crops commercialize, even if they were under the control of women, they often move over to men when money becomes involved. I'd seen that happen in Western Kenya. It's happened in rice in the Gambia. There's famous studies about that. So as we set out, we said, how can we set this up and work in a partnership with the private sector? And we worked with Urubitsu Enterprises, the largest agro-processor in Rwanda, to say from the beginning, we're gonna set targets to make sure that women aren't excluded from the value chain. Um, so in the first, we spent a year doing research with the Rwanda Agricultural Board food scientist at the private sector's uh, factory. He was a juice producer, he makes many fruit juices, and he had a large bakery operation. And he was the ideal person to work with because in his backside of this massive property he had, he has over a thousand pigs, rabbits, chickens, he was a livestock producer as well. So any waste from the sweet potato could go right into his livestock operation. And we examined and decided in conversations with him that instead of moving forward with juice as the first product, we would look at our entry point with wheat flour substitution. As I mentioned before, Rwanda is not like, unlike any, many other countries in sub-Saharan Africa in that it imports almost all of its wheat. Um, in total, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa spent $2.3 billion importing wheat. Of course, it's uh, American Independence Day. They were supporting my country because a lot of that comes from America, I think. Um, and the benefit of sweet potato is any class of farmer can grow sweet potato from the poorest smallholder to the largest. But the smallholders, the big challenge to be linked into an agro-processor is having enough surplus to sell because the first priority is food security. And so we developed, um, uh, we really had to move in with virus index tested planting material, working very closely with the Rwanda Agricultural Board to get disease-free planting material of the improved orange flesh sweet potato varieties out to farmers. And because we were able to do that, yields doubled. And that meant the smallholder could participate in the market. The other thing we did is we had two different kinds of farmers, farmers that were linked, uh, individual contracts to the agro-processors, and then farmers that were grouped into associations. Because the other thing that agro-processors want is consistent supply. And if you have a group of farmers with very small landholding sizes, when they're grouped into associations, then different people can supply at different periods of time. And so in total, the group can be a consistent supply, whereas the individual may not have enough to supply. And we had very distinct groups. Uh, we had one NGO that was helping to backstop and work in particular with groups that uh, really the predominant members were women headed households, and even child-headed households. As you know, Rwanda went through a terrible genocide, and there are a lot of female and orphan-headed households there. And these groups really needed additional training in order to be able to reach the quality standards to be able to participate in the chain, but they succeeded. So the first year we tested these four products, queen cakes, bread, biscuits, and donuts. We compared the products made with puree, which is steamed in mashed sweet potato versus flour, and we undertook a number of consumer evaluations, and of course we costed out these products. And it became obviously clear that using the puree, the paste of steamed and mashed roots was the way to go, and it was just economics and quality that was driving it, because it takes four and a half kilograms to make a kilogram of flour, and it takes 1.6 kilograms of fresh roots to make a kilogram of puree. So the flour was more expensive than wheat flour, so it didn't make economic sense to substitute it. Uh, and with our bread, for instance, using the puree compared to the bread that was just made with 100% wheat flour, 
Um, there was a 12%, I mean, sorry, the biscuits made with 100% wheat flour, there was a 12% cost reduction in the production of the product. So for an agro-processor to want to be engaged in this, you have to demonstrate that they'll actually be saving money in making this product because it does require changing aspects of their operation to use the mashed sweet potato. The whole technological development package that we engaged in uh, required not just finding the right product, but really a substantial investment in new technologies and training and the recognition when we did our market research that really what this gentleman had to compete against as an owner of a local company was you had to have packaging that was competitive with imported biscuits. We decided to go with the biscuits. We called them the golden power biscuit. And you can see the packaging that we ended up coming up with, which took us eight months because in Rwanda, Plastic is banned. You can't introduce a new product using plastic. So this was his local packaging, which was cardboard. And we introduced this concept of tubes, like the Pringle tubes, the first time a tube had been used in Rwanda, but it's uh, all recyclable material. And then these aluminum foil bags were permitted. The tubes were aimed at the higher income market um, that could pay a little bit more because it was more expensive packaging and the aluminum foil at the lower end market. But what we found over time as we were monitoring this, the big tubes ended up being po uh, even popular among the low income consumers because they could store other things in them. They would keep them and use them for other activities. So the tubes turned out to be the big hit. As you can see, we introduced a new uh, biscuit making machine uh, and had technical support from the, the your ingredients technician that we worked with. Uh, and obtain the equipment for, from Italy. So it was a question of getting farmers trained with more productive varieties. You can see that's uh, a pile of sweet potato coming out from just a couple of rows of the crop, very productive orange flesh varieties, going into the puree, replacing the manual hand cutting of the biscuits and the old technology with a machine so they can increase their output and make a product that could be competitive with imported biscuits. We also had a very significant and substantial demand creation campaign. And you never know how these things are going to work because we were up with the image change. That sweet potato is no longer a crop of the poor. That sweet potato is this really cool food. And the, the key to all this was one of the best hires I think my staff member ever made. He found Amy. Amy is a young man. He was 22 years old when he found him. He was a radio announcer. And he wanted to do a master's in science communication. So we said, great, work with our project part time. And he has become, he is now known in Rwanda as Mr. Sweet Potato. <laughs> and Amy, every time we had a launch event or an exhibition, Amy would have all his buddies from the media there you know, uh, from the two television stations and the three newspapers. So this was the best investment in terms we ever made. He became a, a promoter and he was able to reach out to the young people and let them know that eating these biscuits was really cool. We put lots of signs up, billboards for the multipliers, the seed multipliers, so they would know where to get their sweet potato vines. And in the second year of the project after the launch, the owner of the company himself produced a television ad that stayed on the television for about eight months and really it became nationwide known and now the biscuits and the, the donuts, the mandazi, are sold throughout his 11 stores in the country. So the project sales, this was a four-year project, but at the end of the project, uh, Sina Enterprises or Urbizzo earned $364,000 in sales, that's not profit, that's sales of the Orange Flesh Sweet Potato Projects. We monitored again the year afterwards. He made $403,000, but it was interesting. He sells more of the donuts, which is the fried product you see here, than the biscuits, because he does a lot of sales to buses driving through, um, and he has a small restaurant there and everything in his different outlets. Um, so it's been, uh, it was a real learning experience for us all. How do we get orange flesh sweet potato 
introduced as an ingredient. And in those biscuits, we were replacing 43% of the wheat flour with the orange flesh sweet potato puree. So a significant amount of orange flesh sweet potato was going into this product. Now, did the women benefit? One of the things we were monitoring in this study, because it was a proof of concept project, we achieved our goal that three quarters of the farmers linked to the agro-processor had to be women. And you can, we collected a lot of data on their, uh, their sales and their costs. And again, remember um, that this is a country where for your first, uh, people continue to use the majority of their sweet potato for home consumption. But they ended up selling about a third to it into this market opportunity. And the men were able to have larger land holding sizes and uh, their output value in terms of dollars per hectare were 463 US dollar equivalents. And the women, for the women it was 223, the female owned uh, plots and farms. They both made profits. The men were more economically efficient, but the women made good use of their more limited resources and the more limited amounts of inputs that they had to invest in the system. We had really interesting and high spillover effects. What was the spillover group? The spillover group were people who just got vines from their neighbors. And this is one of the benefits of sweet potato. It's vegetatively propagated and you can just give vine to your neighbors. We were trying to encourage people to buy quality planting material from trained vine multipliers, but a lot of transmission goes farmer to farmer. That's the tradition. And you can see that the spillover households also were benefiting from having much higher profits per hectare uh, than the control households. And control households are those how so here and the, these households you have them making $139, $144 per hectare compared to the control households that we randomly selected from the neighboring villages that were 104 for the women-led households and 31 for the male growers of sweet potato. So we feel that even spillover effects were significant in this area of people growing and that's being driven by the higher yielding uh, orange flesh materials that were also quality planting materials without viruses. Then we moved over into Western Kenya. Now, Urubitsu Enterprises was our real attempt to say, okay, what's a good technology that we're going to use? But most bakers we found don't want to really be making the puree. Not everybody has a thousand pigs in their backyard. And so in Kenya, we've taken a different model where we're working on building up a local factory, Oregoni uh, Limited in Western Kenya, which is the heart of the production area, to make the puree. Then the puree is shipped, uh, vacuum packed, to Tusky Supermarkets, which is now, since Nakamat just went out of business, it's just become the largest supermarket chain in Kenya. It used to say second largest. Um, and they make an orange flesh sweet potato bread where we're replacing 35% of the wheat flour with the orange flesh sweet potato puree. The bread is off the shelves uh, by the end of the morning. It's doing quite well and it's come out to be su superior to the white, the pure uh, white uh, flour uh, bread in all our consumer studies, highly preferred by the customers. We've now expanded, they now have another client, Niva's Supermarkets, which is a competing client. So this again shows the potential for really doing this wheat flour substitution approach. The challenge, of course, and there's always a research challenge that goes with these new products, puree is a wet product, so it comes with a lot more food safety issues than a dry product like flour. And concurrently in this phase of our project, we have uh, together um, with BECA, the Biosciences for Eastern and Central Africa, opened a food and nutritional evaluation laboratory panel that's led by our regional scientist, Dr. Tawanda Musinge. So the real challenge of getting this factory going was food safety training. In fact, we had to go in and do it with our partners three times and get the manager fired and convince the owner to hire a new manager who believed in enforcing food safety practices because you can't have microbes getting into this wet product. Um, so that 
really is a revelation in terms of how these things have to move together. It's not just about introducing a new recipe. It's a whole new procedure of how do you produce a safe product. We have the capacity at this laboratory to analyze beta carotene levels because we are not saying that every product we're going to be working with with the private sector will be healthy, but we want it to be healthier. And we want it to be at least meeting these minimum requirements for saying it's a good source of vitamin A. So we're using the FDA guidelines from the United States in this regard, where they say a food containing 10% of the RDA for the target group per serving is a good source of that micronutrient. If it contains 20%, it's considered an excellent source of that micronutrient. So we're trying to do the balance between wanting to increase income for farmers. We know that not all, you know, I'm never going to say a French fry is a healthy product, but we can make it a healthier product than the existing French fries by having the uh, beta carotene. Then we have another challenge. Right now, when we started out, we were using a cold chain to move the puree from the factory to Tuskies. So the challenge I gave to my food scientist is, Haha, get me a shelf storable puree for at least three months that doesn't need refrigeration. Now, super technologies already exist in the world, particularly in the United States. There's a high-tech microwave-based technology. The machine only costs a million dollars. Um, and aseptic packaging. You can see this is a test model. They won't let you take the picture of the real machine. I visited their factory in North Carolina. Um, but they have this kind of packaging and machinery that you can put it in and it'll stay for 12 months and you pull it out after 12 months and it looks as beautiful and orange as when you put it in. It's a wonderful technology, it's just not affordable under our conditions. So the challenge is getting something that's affordable and that can be preserved. And so he worked very hard on this and we have come up with a vacuum packed puree stable for three months at 15 to 24 degrees centigrade with the following locally available preservatives, sorbate, benzoate, and citric acid. We also developed a high fiber version which with good washing techniques, you don't have to remove the skin of the sweet potato and that really lowers your costs of production. And the skin actually has very good dietary fiber content and more iron and zinc content. So we make a high fiber puree now. We've developed the bread with the high fiber puree and consumers don't notice the difference. And so it's a win for the company and it's a win for the bread makers as well. The challenge we had with the um, preservatives, however, is that it's good for making the flatbreads, the chapatis and everything, but sorbates retard yeast activity. So to use the shelf stable orange flesh sweet potato puree, we had to alter the recipe to compensate for the fact that the uh, preservatives were having a significant effect on the volume of the bread and on the amount of time it took to proof. So the larger bakeries didn't want to spend an extra half hour waiting for the bread to proof. The smaller bakeries will do it, but not the larger ones. So we did develop a separate recipe, but that also makes us look to the next goal. And I think we'll be able to do it on our way forward. What we're looking to do now, because again, technology keeps improving. And what keeps improving is the fact that now the hot, these machines that are called hot fill machines have come down. And with a hot fill machine, and at $10,000, it's now affordable for a medium scale enterprise we be able to do, if we can find the appropriate packaging, which might be stainless steel cans that we recycle, or some aseptic packaging coming out of different places, because that cost is finally coming down, we would be able to fill the container, seal it, and not have to use preservatives. And this would open up a whole range of direct consumption project, uh, products using the orange flesh sweet potato puree. It, obviously, baby foods already um, uh, do that uh, using sweet potato. School feeding programs, institutional buyers, culinary applications. And again, it would continue to be an industrial uh, ingredient in bakery products, but could store longer and without the preservatives. So we're really hopeful that this is going to be a breakthrough product uh, to be used throughout Sub-Saharan Africa 
that will promote markets in which all kinds of farmers, large and small, can participate in the value chains. And it turns the products into a beautiful golden color. So we've had no resistance to marketing these products and puts more vitamin A into the product. There's a lot of other economically viable products emerging. Um, this is, you can see the japati here is using the orange flesh sweet potato puree in a very popular flat uh, bread that's utilized a lot in East Africa. Obviously you can do crisps and chips. Again, I'm not claiming they're healthy, I'm just claiming they're <laughs> economically viable. And a lovely sweet potato juice that's 85% sweet potato um, and 15% pineapple, or a juice that's 100% sweet potato with ginger added have proved to be accepted to, to consumers and really profitable as well. There are donut, uh, muffin makers are emerging in the cities in uh, Nairobi, and the, he's making a very nice profit margin on his muffins as well. So we're very excited about this opportunity for opening up markets for farmers that grow sweet potato and breaking into the urban markets of Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you want recipes, please look at www.sweetpotatoknowledge.org. We have recipes recommended, um, and uh, it's really a fun crop to work with. If you think of anything you can do with potato or cassava, you can do it with sweet potato and even more. So I will end there. Is it uh, Toda? Yes. And uh, I would like to thank, on the initiative, we really have a number of key partners we're working on as we're trying to scale and reach 10 million households by 2020. And these are our donor partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UK Aid, USAID, Irish Aid, and uh, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. We work with many NGO partners and others in North Carolina State University in the States to try and make a difference to nutrition in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. I think we'll take one question before we move on. Yes. The question is if uh, they're trying to export to Europe. That's a very interesting question. Um, there are, uh, there is a group actually, an Israeli company I've been trying to track down because they're working with a group of outgrowers in northern Tanzania with the idea of major exports to Europe. You get this interesting conflict going in the sense that um, what's been nice is they've, they're working with the Tanzanian Agriculture Horticulture Association and they've given them three years to get it right before they start the export process. So they said, if you can't give us 35 tons per hectare, we aren't working with you. So they've really had to work with farmers on agronomic improvement, irrigation systems. But the guy who's really benefited from this is an owner of a small tissue culture company up in northern Tanzania. Because for the European market, they don't want to use African varieties. They want jewel because that's what they're used to getting from, from the United States, which is a low dry matter variety that's highly virus susceptible. So these poor farmers have to buy new planting material every year. This guy's making a mint <laughs> because the variety breaks down after two seasons because it's not an African bread variety like we're using. So we're hoping over time that we'll convince them to use some of the materials coming out of the national breeding programs and we're hoping European consumers will be able to open their eyes that there's more than one type of sweet potato variety. Um, because, but right now this guy is uh, making, it's a highly profitable seed business. Yes, we will have them singing the sweet potato song and saying, please buy sweet potatoes that are bred in Africa for, for Africa. <laughs> Thank you.